The order of our service will be a bit different than it normally is because of the nature of what I want to talk with you about this morning. And I want to begin by stating this as my thesis for today. The three most important things that the church does, number one, we live the Christian life. Number two, we fulfill the mission that Christ has given the church. And number three, we come together on a regular basis to worship Almighty God. If I'm correct in those being the three most important things that we do, then those three things deserve our very best effort. And I want to begin this study this morning by reminding you that over the last few weeks, I've been delivering a series of messages on the worship of the church. And in these messages, we have not been primarily concerned about a home devotional or a young people's meeting after Sunday night service. But rather, we are focusing upon what we do in the worship of the church. And we've had in mind Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians chapters 10 through 16 deal with worship. And in the midst of all that, he said this, when the whole church comes together. That's our emphasis in this series. When the whole church comes together and our purpose in gathering is to worship. And so in this series, we have been talking about what God has asked us to do, the avenues that he's given us for our worship. We've talked about the singing that we do in worship. We've talked about the preaching. We've talked about prayer. And this morning, we're going to be talking about the supper. Here's how I want to begin. I want us to be reminded of the purposes of worship. And the writer of the book of Hebrews laid them down for us in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 19. The writer said that Christ has now opened the way for us into heaven. we can now approach God because of the work that Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross. And having said that, he then made these three points that focus the purpose of worship. He said, number one, Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us draw near. Now, I don't know anything that might refer to unless it's talking about our drawing near to God because Christ made it possible. And I want to suggest that purpose number one for worship is to praise God. If we miss that, we, we would miss why we've come together to praise God. Then in verse 23, he said, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. 
And I'm reminded that our confession as Christians is Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Isn't that true? And he says, hold fast to that. If we hold fast to our confession of who Jesus is, then we recognize that one of the purposes that we come together is to remember him. And then in verse 24, he said, let us consider one another to stir up one another to love and to good works. We come here to praise God in worship. We come here to remember Jesus Christ. And we come here to encourage, to build up one another. Now, let me ask this question. If worship is designed for praise and remembrance and encouragement, what if the church as a whole assembled just as frequently as I individually come into the assembly. To ask that question another way, it's this. Do we see the urgency of our being in our place when the church comes together? And if the whole church did as well at that as I do, and make that personal, as I do, how much praise would there be given to God? How much remembrance would there be of Christ if everybody did this church assembly like I do? And how much encouragement would go on if everybody encouraged the way I do? You see, the tragedy of that is that we come together as a people and certainly our motive must be pure. But it's possible for us to come here and never worship. And if we miss, we miss something God wants us to have. And it's not an accident that after the writer of Hebrews says, let us draw near, let us hold fast, let us encourage each other. He said, and do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I just wanted us to ponder the issue of if everybody in the church worshiped as often or as well as I do, how much worship would be going on? That's the importance of this issue today. Now with that, let's come to our biblical text. A moment ago, we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is one of the most or best known passages in the New Testament that has to do with the supper of the Lord. And it's that that I want to emphasize today. And let me begin with the background to the text that we read. 1 Corinthians, the entire book of 1 Corinthians, is an inspired commentary on church life. And in church life, number two, there often are issues or problems that arise, and that was true of Corinth. And Paul's method is he raises a problem, an issue, and then gives a solution to it. Now, number three, it is well known that the first century church, in addition to the coming together in assembly for worship, also had fellowship meals. 
they were called love feasts. Now they were not the worship and they were not even a part of the worship. It'd be like us today having an assembly like this and then following this assembly, having a potluck. But the church at Corinth had gotten all that mixed up. They didn't really know what their coming together was for or what they should do when they came together. It should be noted that when they came together for worship or when they participated in one of their love feasts, that both of those coming togethers had to do with unity and brotherly love. But the Corinthians decided to make a common meal out of the Lord's Supper, if we could even imagine that. And so those who had much, brought much, and ate much, and they didn't care about those who didn't have much. They sort of gathered together in their cliques. And they not only corrupted the Lord's Supper by making a common meal out of it, but they corrupted their worship. Now, those five things give us the background for the text that we've read this morning from 1 Corinthians 11. So I want you now, if you will, to turn with me to Paul's statement about the, the supper. And, and let's first of all note the meaning of the text that we read. And then we will allow Paul to speak to us about how we are to observe the supper. We begin in 1 Corinthians 11 at verse 17. Notice with me quickly these points of emphasis. In verse 17, Paul is laying before the Corinthians and before us the purpose of our gathering. And he says, now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. The assembly, whether it be for worship or for fellowship and eating, was designed for everybody's good. But everybody was not getting good from either the worship or their love feasts. The Corinthians were selfish. Here's a point of emphasis with Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. We have a lot of differences because people are different. But as Christians, we have one thing that holds us together. And that one thing is not our educational levels because we have different educational levels. That one thing is not our wealth because we have different economic situations. And we leave those differences outside. And we come into worship and this worship is designed for everybody's good. Since the Corinthians were failing so miserably, Paul said, it isn't for your good, it's for your bad. Number two at verse 18, there is to be no party spirit. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe. I believe it. The, the Corinthians were not together. 
we're together. I know that within the fellowship of the church, every one of us has special friends. There ain't anything wrong with that. But all of us must be big enough and observant enough that we make every person who comes through those doors feel at home at this place. And that isn't a responsibility of the greeters at the door, though that's what they do. That's the responsibility of all of us. And so whatever interests I have here in uh, speaking with my best friends, I'm to put that aside for now to do what is most important, and that is to make certain everybody feels at home here. No party spirit. Verse 19, number three. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. True Christians are going to emerge. And those are the folks that are seeking to be what God intended for the church to be. And it's bigger than any one of us. And it must be inclusive of all of us. And then number four. At verse 20, the Corinthians, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Well, I thought that was one of the reasons they came together. It was but they had corrupted the supper and were only going through the motions. Does the Lord want us to take the supper? Yes. Were they taking it? Yes. But they were not taking it in the right way and with the right purpose in mind. So it wasn't, they were not successful in taking the Lord's Supper going through the motions. Number five, verse 21. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another drunk. There was the spirit of exclusiveness. And that's not right among Christians. Number six, at verse 22. What do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Now, when I was a young guy growing up, there was some discussion in local churches as to what we could do in a church building. And there were some who took the point of view that church buildings were built for worship and therefore it was not right to eat in buildings. And this passage from Paul was often cited to prove the point. Let me say before I emphasize Paul's point that church buildings are not even discussed in Scripture. So I would be very reluctant to say what could go on in a church building, provided it be within the framework of the Christian community. But Paul is saying, have you not houses to eat and drink in? If you're going to gather into your spatial groups and exclude others, do that meeting of the spatial group at home. That's not for the church. Now, Paul is, is pretty plain in what he says about the purpose of the supper. This is the framework in which the Corinthians were failing. Now, having noted the purpose, Paul then goes in to how to eat the Lord's Supper. And this is always pertinent, will always be appropriate first consider these truths. How are we to eat the Lord's Supper? Now, let's preface the how by four other questions. 
The first is, who is to eat the supper? Acts 20, verse 7 says, Upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. It is not the purpose of this message today to go into the background of Paul saying the church came together to break bread. And whether or not that's referring to the Lord's Supper. It is, and for now, I'm just going to state that. They came together for the express purpose of taking the Lord's Supper. Who took the Lord's Supper? The disciples came together. So the supper is meaningful only to those of us who are disciples of Christ. That's the who. Now, what is the what of the Lord's Supper? Well, in the gospel records, and I'll refer now to Mark 14, when Jesus met with his disciples just before his death, he was observing with them the Passover feast, which was a, an Old Testament feast. And in that feast, he took bread. And I know that it was unleavened bread. How do I know that? Because at the feast of Passover, the Jews had no leaven in their houses. So he took this unleavened bread and he broke it, having given thanks and told them, this is my body. Obviously, he didn't mean this is my literal flesh, but this bread will, through the years, represent my body, and I want you to break it and eat of it. He also took a cup, the fruit of the vine, the fruit of the grape. So I don't want to take orange juice. I love orange juice, but I don't want that in the Lord's Supper. Why? Because Jesus took the fruit of the vine and said, this is my blood. Not my literal blood. It represents my blood. Drink it. All of you take of it. And that's the what. The bread and the fruit of the grape. So the who is disciples. The what is the bread and the cup. The third question is why? Why do we do that? When Jesus broke the bread and gave it to them and took the cup and gave them the cup, he said, this do in remembrance of me. So for all time, that will be the reason that we take it. Why? Jesus asked us to remember him. Then that brings us to the issue of when. When's this going to be? The disciples came together upon the first day of the week to break the bread. Please do not quibble with me about whether or not that's every Sunday. Because that has really nothing to do with what Paul's talking about in Acts 20 and 7. What it does have everything to talk about is that that was the purpose for which they came to the first day of the week meeting. Therefore, they did it every first day of the week. If somebody wants some additional information on that sort of thing, I would take them back to the giving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, when God said to ancient Israel, remember the Sabbath. He didn't say remember every Sabbath, but we know in reading our Bibles that he meant every Sabbath because you remember there was that day when one of the men of Israel went out and broke the Sabbath. He just broke one of them, but he failed to keep it every Sabbath. And Moses didn't know what to do, and he took the matter to God, and God said, stone him to death. 
When God says something, we need to take what he says and seek to do what he asks us to do and not seek to debate him as to whether it's important or not. So on the first day of the week, they came together for that purpose. Now, returning to Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, the question is how are we to partake? And it begins in verse 23. This first little paragraph in verses 23 through 25, Jesus said twice over as here quoted by Paul, do this in remembrance of me. So number one, we remember. When we come together to take the Lord's Supper, we're not thinking about whether or not it's going to rain out our afternoon activity. We're remembering Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary. Number two at verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We are announcing our faith when we come here to partake of the Lord's Supper. We are proclaiming who he is, what he's done, and that he's coming again. Number three at verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. We're to take worthily. Please notice that that's not talking about whether you're worthy personally or not to come around the Lord's table. We're made worthy because of Jesus, not because of our goodness. I remember years ago when I was doing some preaching as a student over in West Tennessee that every once in a while, somebody in one of the congregations of West Tennessee, member of the church would not take the Lord's Supper and, and people would notice that and they'd say, why didn't you take the Lord's Supper? He'd say, well, I sinned this week. What? We all sinned this week. It isn't talking about your personal goodness. It's talking about Christ's goodness and what he's made of you. Being worthy has nothing to do with me other than my relationship to Christ. If I'm in Christ, I'm worthy. But it is the manner in which I take it. Am I seeking to concentrate upon the body and the blood of Jesus? And I know there are all kinds of things that tend to interrupt us. And some of those things cannot be avoided. And I'm not talking about the exception. I'm talking about what we do when we come around the Lord's table. We're not trying to get through something. We're trying to do something in the way that Christ asks us to do it in a worthy manner. Number four, there must be self-examination. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I do not decide for you, and you do not decide for me. I come together and I break the bread and drink the cup in the right way. And I'm examining myself to see that I do that. Number five. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So I take with discernment. I'm seeking to concentrate upon his flesh that was torn there for me and upon his blood that was poured out there for me. Discerning the Lord's body. Someone came up with the idea that discerning the Lord's body was referring to the spiritual body of the church. Well, I do have interest in the church when I take of the supper, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But the whole context about which Christ, uh, uh, Paul is speaking here is Christ's death for us. That's what I'm to discern. And then... 1 Corinthians 10 in verse 16. And remember that 1 Corinthians 10 through chapter 16 
is a context of worship. And in chapter 10, in verse 16, Paul said, do you not know that the cup of blessing which we drink is communion with the body of Christ. And the bread that we break is communion with the Christ. Commune is a good word. It means fellowship. When we take of the supper, we have fellowship with Christ himself. And we also have fellowship with each other. And that's where the church as the body of Christ comes in. The supper is in memory of Christ, but we are gathered together and we take of it as one. So when we worship God... We want to do what he's asked us to do in the way that he's asked us to do it. That's true in regard to every avenue of our worship. And it's true in regard to the Lord's Supper. In a few moments, we're going to, as we're gathered here together today, break the bread and drink the fruit of the vine. And as we look forward to that part of this worship assembly today, I want to ask you, are you a disciple, therefore one who can come to the table of the Lord and remember that his body was broken and his blood was shed for you? And if you are not a disciple, do you not see the need of belonging to Jesus? He died for our sins. There is no other answer for our sins. Shouldn't we want to belong to him? And this morning, if somebody is here and would like to become a New Testament Christian, upon the basis of, as a penitent believer, confessing faith in Christ and being immersed into Jesus today so that his blood could take away sin, we welcome you to respond during our invitation song and we'll wait on you. And it does not inconvenience us. We want you to respond to Christ We want you to become a disciple today. And Richard's going to lead us in this invitation song. And we really want you to come. Let's stand together, Richard.